welcome back to the channel. I wanted to start off to say I am very sorry about the audio quality of the last video. I'm not sure what happened. I did find that there were some bugs in the microphone I got, so I quick replaced that and they are back on the road. The girl behind the counter just says that this happens with all technology and I completely understand that. Technology never works for me. <laughs> so I wanted to talk to you guys today a little bit about Nietzsche or Nietzsche. Um, his name is pronounced a couple of ways. So this semester I'm taking a class that is completely involved and surrounding focusing on Nietzsche. First we've gone through Birth of Tragedy and then the Gay Science and then we've been going through his Beyond Good and Evil both this last week and next. And the big question that Nietzsche asks the world is, what is truth? Beyond good and evil basically is, why do we revolve ourselves so much around ethics and moral codes, ethical codes of conduct? What are the truths behind both good and evil? Basically, what he says is there is no absolute truth in the way that most people see it. There are truths like gravity exists. That is a definite and provable truth, but there is no truth that to what is good or bad in most cases. As someone who is going to school to be an ethicist, this was very interesting to me. It being a required history class, I uh, am kind of taking it by storm in that I'd love to see the other side of ethics. Every good debater knows the other side of their argument. The other side to the argument of needing morals and ethics is Nietzsche's nihilism. He is the father of nihilism. In just a few words, it is that nothing matters and there is no real purpose to life. Like, you just do you, dog, <laughs> kind of thing. It was, it's pretty uh, chill and roll with the punches, basically. But this can also, like, go in a bad way and you could, you know, do bad things because you don't think there's any real purpose to life. And one cannot justify themselves with that in a real society. Another thing that Nietzsche kind of founded was perspectivism, which is that our truth is just our reality. The way we see the world, the reality, is just our perspective. I've taken a couple of sociology classes, and in those, we learn the exact same thing. In the intro to sociology, the first thing we learned was to have a sociological imagination. What that is, is to have cultural relativism, and that we cannot judge others for being different different or, you know, being different than our culture because it doesn't really matter <laughs> in a real way. Take, for instance, like social norms, different folkways, mores, and taboos. All of these differ from society to society and even in smaller cases from city to city. So sociology tells us that in a small way, culture is people creating small carbon copies of themselves and their own norms and what they do. And this is our culture. This is who we are. The fun part about the word culture is that it, it goes in so many different directions. And one thing that uh, Buddhists say is that you have to cultivate yourself. And pretty much all philosophers say this, is that you have to learn as much as you can. And Confucius says, I'm pretty sure it's Confucius, he says, learning or knowledge is infinite, but the human lifespan is finite. And so to seek all knowledge is leading you to only dissatisfaction. But the route to seeking knowledge is what leads you to true satisfaction. To cultivate yourself and to round yourself out 
as a human being and staying out of ignorance. I think that that is really basically the basis of perspectivism in that you find yourself with many different perspectives coming from a lot of different places and that's why we cultivate ourselves because when you learn different perspectives, you can see things from different points of view and then you can realize what is good or what is bad and most often you say, everything just is. Life is that simple. What I really want to do in my lifetime is take a nice portion of it to study the creator of Star Trek, Gene Roddenberry. He created the Star Trek's Starfleet, the uh, the people are in Starfleet in Star Trek, they run by a code of conduct called the Prime Directive, or also known as the Non-Interference Directive. And this code of conduct is where the people in Starfleet, in Star Trek, when they're traveling and adventuring and seeking new worlds, <laughs> Um, they can't interfere with underdeveloped alien races, like the ones without technology or the ones who can't, like, move past a specific social barrier. They can't just be like, here's the easy fix to your problem, I'll just fix that for you. Uh, because that's how people become dependent on other people. In the Star Trek universe, there is not a whole lot of talk on what goes on on Earth, like zero episodes happen on Earth, but when they do talk about it, it sounds like the most utopian place you'd ever heard of. Like, they don't use money, they don't um, rely on healthcare, they're pretty much the most socialist society you'd ever heard of because everyone just has each other's backs, everyone just works for the same goal, and that is the happiness of society and one's own happiness. One could expect, like, all of the small jobs are just done by robots, and the rest of society goes and does what they actually want to. And because the universe is so humongous, and pretty much jobs are infinite if you can just learn an alien language, it's really you can just do anything, and I know that that wouldn't be entirely possible in our society because there aren't just other planets to go to when there aren't enough jobs here, but robotic automation is happening, and for that reason, I think that Star Trek would be the most perfect uh, type of universe and type of philosophy to look at. Gene Roddenberry really wrote the most beautiful show. He goes through a lot of very famous ethical problems through his characters. The specific one I have in mind is Next Generation. Captain Picard is like the master at dealing with ethical situations. The one very specific episode I have in mind is where Will Wheaton breaks a law on a planet where if you break a law, you have to die, which is ridiculous, but that's the most intense form of deontology you'd ever heard of. If you don't follow the rules, you're not allowed to be a part of society, and that's how they make it work. Captain Picard has to make the prime directive work, like how do I not interfere with their laws but still abide by the prime directive and still save Will Wheaton, of course. I mean... <laughs> I think that if Nietzsche were alive today, he would be a lot like Gene Roddenberry, as well as Socrates. Both Nietzsche and Socrates were part of the creators of the epistemological movement, which is how do you know what you know? What is the truth? Where does this come from? My question to now is, where Nietzsche called himself the philosopher of the future, and that future is relatively now, 
we almost need a new philosopher of the future. And that's where I think that we should look to Gene Roddenberry. Looking at both of them, I think that we should ask ourselves, why do we find such value in money? What is, what is the truth to money? Why do we give each other things and then give the other person a slip of paper? Or in almost all scenarios, just atoms floating in the internet, where in a real sense it doesn't exist. How much of the world's money today is digital and where if the computers shut down, it wouldn't exist. Like if the computers shut down and we couldn't even look at the computer screens and no one could even know how much money they had because their memory is broken all of a sudden, they would go mad. We would fall into chaos because we don't know how to not have a high value on money. This is where we have to look at society and maybe even think about taking it away. I think another fun thing would, to talk about would be like Patreon. The whole uh, philosophy behind Patreon and that we're funding ourselves basically. I mean like are any actual like multi-million dollar people funding small creators with Patreon? If so, please tell me. I would love to know. But in any normal scenario, it's someone with like a thirty to $80,000 a year job funding someone else to have that much. And we're almost recreating our own economy without the big guys involved at all. I think that's hilarious and beautiful in itself. I would love to promote that and I don't know. I would just love to talk about money with you guys. I think it's a very interesting topic. Is it just one of humanity's odd truths? One of the non-absolute truths that we just all attune ourselves to? We all just listen to the big guys who have been running the world for thousands of years. Or not that, hundreds of years. Why do we still do this? I don't know. I, I could talk on this for hours. I've honestly been thinking about uh, why does the cost of living go up? Why is that an absolute truth? I'm convinced it's just because it does. There's no reason. It just does. If anyone has an actual reason, please let me know. Maybe that could be the topic of our next video. But in any case, I will see you then. And thank you so much for joining me today and sticking around this long. And I love you. Have a great one. Bye-bye.